Should we have more Christmas hymns than Easter hymns in our hymnal? We've had over three times more Christmas hymns than Easter hymns in the 1985 hymnal. Will this ratio continue? I hope not. Hi, I'm Dr. Doug Pugh, and in this video, I'm going to review a new addition to our hymnal of an old Easter hymn, Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise, with words by Charles Wesley and music by Robert Williams. Uh, this is a staple of the English hymnal for many decades it's been there, and I'm really glad that we're adding it to ours. I've always found it strange that in our tradition, we've typically focused quite a bit more on Christmas music than Easter music. But would Christmas matter if we didn't have Easter? Deciding which one is more important than the other can be a bit of a chicken and egg situation. But Easter for sure is the culmination. It's the reason we celebrate Christmas because he came to save us at Easter time. In other Christian traditions, Easter gets a huge focus. And there are many great hymns that surround the Easter season. I'm really hopeful that we will have many more Easter and Atonement hymns in our new hymnal than we have in the past. Uh, as I review this Easter hymn, I'll share five writing techniques you can use to enhance your own sacrament meeting music. Technique 1. Mirrored Melodic Bass Lines I love a good melodic bass line. In this hymn, we have some really nice melodic shapes in the bass. I want you to notice here on this first line how the bass moves as much and with the melody at every step. In fact, there's a couple spots where the bass moves more than the melody. We do tend to see this quite a bit in older tradition hymns, but just take a look here and listen for a minute how much the bass moves with the soprano. I'll play just those two lines together. continues throughout the hymn, rather than just going with just the same bass as the melody moves. A lot of hymns do that, and it's, you know, there's times and places for it, but in this kind of celebratory uh, exclamation of hailing the day that Christ is risen, it's joyful, and so to have the bass moving as much as the melody adds to the atmosphere and the excitement, and it makes your voice leading much more interesting, because things are happening, things are moving. The more things stay the same, the more you have the potential to become monotonous. Now, of course, there are times when a stillness is something you want to create to depict a certain mood. Fair game, of course. In this particular moment, we're not really going for stillness. We're going for, hooray, alleluia. So to have this <clears throat> mirroring of the melodic motion in the bass, and often in contrary motion with the bass, but I'm talking more rhythmically of moving, moving, moving with the bass, with the melody, uh, is, is very nice. Technique two, suggesting solutions for semi-strange chord doublings. Now, I may get tarred and feathered by the other traditionalists listening, but I, I find that there's a, some kind of strange doublings in the chords, and, uh, you know, I have some suggestions for maybe changing those if you wanted to do so. Uh, here at the very beginning, <clears throat> hail the day that sees him rise, there's a kind of a odd-sounding doubling of the sixth chord, the sixth chord, it ten, does tend to have the third of the chord doubled because the third of the sixth chord is the tonic note of the key that we're in. But for me, in this moment, we're talking uh, especially, let me highlight it for you, about right here. In this spot, the distance between the two female voices and the two bass voices, they're pretty far apart. There's no rule broken here as far as like old school voice leading rules are concerned because we have a, an octave between tenor and alto. But it, I don't know. For me, it kind of takes away from the jubilation of this sound. I would personally rather take the uh, tenors up to the D. So what we have written is I would prefer put the tenors up there. Him rise. And I 
think the tenor should stay up on C rather than going down to G. It it's just it's up there, and that the tenors will help the 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 feel of this praising. Okay, there's no real need to jump down to the G. Now on the next measure on the Alleluia, the first of the Alleluias, there's kind of a weird thing here. Um, we have a we have a what looks like a three chord. We have the A and the bass and tenor doubled, and then we have C and C in the ladies. So we have two A's and two C's. Interestingly, the chord that the uh, the editors chose to put here for the guitar chord is F, but there's no F on this chord at all. There is on beat three, we get an F. Um, so it's it's a little bit ambiguous. <clears throat> is this a three chord? Is it an A minor chord? Or is it an F chord in first inversion? Let's hear the differences. Uh, you would have to move the alto probably in each of these situations. So first I'm going to play C's him rise, and then I'm going to go to a three chord with the alto moved from the middle C up to the E, which is my personal preference. Here's how it sounds. Okay, so that's one option. Another option would be to use the F in the alto instead of the C, which would make this a one chord in first inversion, which would sound like... That's also a very good option. Just a little different flavor. We have major first inversion with the F in the alto, or minor root position with the E in the alto... You know, pick your flavor. Everybody will have a different opinion. Uh, I just think it's cl clearer. When you only have two A's and two C's, it's like we can't tell the gender of the chord. We don't, we don't really know, is it a major chord, is it a minor chord, because we don't really have enough to tell. So we have some more doublings like this. The same thing happens on line two. Um, and then down on line three, in measures 11. And then on line four, in measure 13, we have one more, uh, well, two more of these doubling suggestions. So here on beat four of measure, uh, what is that? Measure 11, 9, 10, oh, yeah, measure 11, we have a diminished chord, a diminished chord that's tonicizing C. That's why there's a B natural there. It's a pretty common technique to arrive on C, the five chord, and put a diminished chord in front of it. Okay, it's like 5-1 to the 5, but it's 7 instead of 5. 7 and 5, they have a lot of similar properties. The issue I have here is the doubling. Uh, traditionally, with major chords and minor chords, your first choice is to double the root, your second choice is to double the fifth, and then your third choice is to double the third. And it all depends on the context. Are we are we able to avoid illegal parallel motion? Are we able to avoid illegal voice crossings and all these other sort of traditional voice leading principles? However, when we come to diminished chords, the best note to double is not the root or the third. Excuse me, or the fifth. The best note to double is the third. Because the root of a diminished chord and the fifth of a diminished chord make a tritone. It's the tritone that creates the gravity to resolve to the next chord. And so if you double those strong gravity notes, they have a tendency to want to move in parallel motion and to imbalance the chord orally. So I would recommend here, instead of having the F in the alto to double the F down in the tenor, to put a D in the alto. This balances the chord in my ear a little better because of the removing of the doubling of the tritone. I'm going to play what's written, and then I'll play uh, my suggestion second. So first, and my recommendation... Uh, just balances the chord better in my ear. Uh, and then lastly, for
for our doubling. Similar kind of an issue down here in bar 13 that we saw up in bar 1. Uh, the distance between the two high soprano alto notes and the two low tenor and bass notes. It'll work a lot better to keep uh, the A going in the tenor, at least to my ear. Uh, it fills out that distance a little bit better and helps the tenors prepare to go up high to the C. Technique three, chains of lyrical inversions. So as I mentioned before, we have a very lyrical bass line, and when that happens, we tend to get what we're looking at here in this situation that's highlighted in yellow. So this is the end of measure three on beat four going into the beginning of, uh, so the end of measure three on beat four going into the beginning of measure four. And you can see that the bass is a nice stepping da -da -da. It's a very smooth thing, and because of that bass line, uh, we, we avoid two very common errors, okay? The first error that we're avoiding is uh, using root position chords in stepping bass. When we have root position chords in a stepping bass situation, you, the possibilities for writing errors are huge. And they, that really kind of destroys the nice resonance we've had up to this point. Uh, so to do that, they use inversions. Okay. However, this leads us to number to a common mistake number two, is that in, so often I see with my students and with others that when trying to make the bass part interesting and the general musical atmosphere interesting. Um, sometimes people fall into the bad habit of doing leapy inversions, in, like a second inversion chord leaping to a first inversion chord that then leaps to another second inversion chord that then leaps to another first inversion chord. I am all for inversions. I love inversions. But it typically, inversions are what we do to create a more melodic bass, meaning we have a more linear style of bass writing. Bass lines that leap a lot are usually circle of fifths kind of bass lines that go from like the one chord to the four chord and, and they jump a fifth or they jump a fourth or sometimes a third. But here, this nice smooth stepping bass, we, we use inversions to give us the chords we want, but to keep them nice and smooth. If we had done these all in root position, we'd have a four chord with B flat in the bass, and then a one chord with F in the bass, and then a two chord with G in the bass, and then a five chord with C in the bass. We still get those chords in a row, but because we go first inversion, second inversion, first inversion, root position, we get a nice melodic bass. So beware, when you're writing a bass line that's more melodic, Make sure you keep yourself clear from potential resonance-sucking mistakes by using inversions to fill in those chords. Technique four, deliciously irregular climax. Okay, every hymn, every song, every piece of music needs a climax. In this particular hymn, our climax comes at the start of measure 10 on the word sinners. And you might think, why climax on the word sinners? Well, we're celebrating Easter, which by the you know the sheer fact that he saved us from our sins, and we're saying here, Christ the Lamb for sinners given, it's like for us. And so it's almost like, thank you, we're shouting out on sinners because that's who we are. Uh, so it actually, it works out pretty well. What I want to highlight here, though, is the interesting way that we get to this climax. Now, if you look at the chord on the downbeat of measure four, we have a big spread out four chord. This is the kind of four chord that we get a lot in music at climax points or at special emotionally charged parts um, where you double the third. The doubled third in this particular case almost always happens in a climactic situation with an octave between and then an octave with the root, but it gets there through some kind of smooth voice leading. It doesn't just jump 
to a wide open four chord with a doubled third. That would that would sound odd. That would sound like a big speed bump in the musical uh, road. Okay, so here <clears throat> we get to this nice big open four chord, which is the highest melody note of the piece. It's a nice big open chord. It's a good uh, emotional moment, but we prepare for that chord in a really unique way. Now, very often when we highlight the four chord at a climax. We'll precede it with what's called the 5-7 of 4. The 5-7 of 4 is a 1 chord with a dominant 7th on it. So we're in the key of F major. That would be F, A, C, E flat. And the E flat's got to go down to D, so it resolves to 4. If that had been the case in this hymn, we would have got 6, 6, 5-7 of 4 then four but we don't we get a little different color listen to the different color here so we still get that flatted note the seventh scale degree flatted that flatted seventh scale degree wants to go to the sixth scale degree which is the third of the four chord so we still get that pretty common nice chromatic resolution to the climax but instead of being accompanied by a dominant chord that e flat that flat seventh scale degree is accompanied by a diminished chord it gives the arrival at sinners a a little bit of a darker um, not painful but it's almost like it's acknowledging the the feel of sin and how we can then be grateful and exclaim out of sin to major chords. Uh, so I, I really like it. So instead of going 5-7 of 4, they go 7 diminished of 4. That is an A diminished triad. And A diminished is the 7 chord in the key of B flat. And it resolves to B flat. That's why we call it the 7 of 4, because 4 is the B flat chord. This is seven, dim seven diminished of four. So instead of getting five seven of four, we get seven diminished to four. Subtle little thing. Something else that adds to the poignancy of this is that when we first hear that diminished chord, it doesn't yet quite have a root. It's getting to the root through the tenor, but it steps through an accented passing tone, the G, which does not fit the chord, and then resolves to the A diminished chord. Now, I can see why the editors of the book called that a C minor chord, because it is a straight-up C minor chord on beat three. However, that makes a lot less sense when you're considering how the E flat resolves to the D and gets to the four chord. This is much more of a, a dominant to a tonic kind of a sound, but a diminished dominant feel to the tonic. So it, it feels to me more like A diminished going to B flat. And I think it really colors the climax beautifully. See, that, that G feels like to me it doesn't belong. Now it belongs. It's great. I love it. I love accented passing tones. Usually you get passing tones between beats, like you see up here. These are, there's a lot of passing tones there, but they're between the beat. Accenting a passing tone, meaning putting it on the beat, makes the tension stand out a little more, which then makes the resolution all the better. Technique five, double diminished tonicizations. Okay, on the same line, the climax line, we just talked about the diminished chord on Lamb 4, which highlights the 4 chord on Sinners in a nice yet somewhat poignant way because of the diminished sound. But that's not the only diminished resolution on this line. We get another one during the Alleluias. If you can see the blue highlight there. We are trying to get to the five chord, but we do it with the diminished chord of that five chord. So the five chord is C, E, G, 
If we were in the key of C, the seven chord would be B natural, D, F, seven, one. But we're in the key of F major. So we're in F, and on Alleluia, we get one chords, and then we get a diminished to five. It makes the arrival at five ooh, feel like we made it kind of a thing. What I love about this is on the same line, on the line of the climax, we highlight our four chord, which is a big pillar chord in tonality, and the other big pillar chord in tonality five, both with diminished chords. Both the four and the five are preceded by diminished chords. In the whole like primary colors of ton uh, tonic dominant relationship Western harmony, the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord seem to be these three planetary rotations of harmony. And we get to those chords, except not the one chord, but we get to the four chord and the five chord on this line, both by using the diminished chord of those chords. And so, like I mentioned before, it colors this praising Easter hymn with a bit of the passion and the pain of what it cost to walk through the grueling atonement and be able to provide us the salvation for which we are shouting Alleluia. So I don't know if the composer thought of that when they were writing it, but it certainly it adds that little sense of the pain of what it cost to purchase our freedom from sin. So what is my opinion of this hymn? It may not be my personal favorite Easter hymn, but it's a very good one, and I'm really glad we are adding it to our tradition. If you'd like to download the complete analysis that I did here so you can study it in more detail, I've dropped the link below in the description box. And if you're enjoying these videos, please support my channel by hitting the subscribe button and ringing that bell so you won't miss any videos in the future. In the next video in this series, I'll review the new LDS hymn number 1202, He is Born the Divine Christ Child.